Hello and welcome to the Business of the Business Podcast. I am your co-host, JP John Paz from the Two Man Power Trip. And of course, joining me is Mr. Trump Manny himself, the wizard, Mr. Lavi Markland. Lavi, how are you doing today, sir? I'm doing great. Can't be much better or have a bigger uh, night, bigger podcast week. Um, we're joined by a very special guest, a returning guest um, this week, um, uh, who oversees one of the biggest, not only Lucha Libre promotions in the world, but one of the biggest pro wrestling promotions in the world. Uh, of course, Lucha Libre AAA. Uh, welcome, Dorian Roldan. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be again here with you guys. Hmm? Awesome to have you back on again to the show. There's always news popping off with AAA. So please tell us the latest on AAA, kind of a, a worldwide thing that's about to be announced with Vikingo against Kenny Omega, right? I mean, the AAA championship for Triple Mania is coming up. Yes, we're we're really excited about it. You know, it's supposed that, that this match... Uh, should be happening a couple years ago in AAA, but because uh, Kenny Omega's injuries, it, it was impossible. But I think uh, we're super happy to have to have this match happening next uh, July 15 in Tijuana, in the second part of Triple Mania. And I think it's a perfect timing for everybody. You know, Bikingo, Bikingo right now, it's a much more mature wrestler he's an uh, uprising talent and and to have this second match in his life with kenny omega will be will be something that we are uh, expecting to be a uh, something incredible man it's just huge tijuana obviously uh triple mania 31 i guess the first part of the, the leg or one of the parts of the legs of the triple mania on july 15th but i mean can't get much bigger right now than omega and vikino who were basically, you know, the quote unquote dream match from uh, AEW that came to fruition. Yeah, basically, as I told you, I think it's going to be a big, a big night for us. It's going to be on fight uh, on pay per view. So basically, we're we're putting all the card together. But I think we're going to have an incredible night with these two guys having one of the best matches. When you look at Triple Mania, obviously, it's one of the biggest, if not your biggest, show of the year. Is that just something that you know you, you go in and you say, "Hey, we got to have you know Vikingo, who's our big star, Vikingo." You got to have Kenny Omega. Like, what's the thought process in putting a match like that together and putting Triple Mania together? Well, basically, what we tried to do, at least in the last couple of years, is to have different kind of matches. You know, not all the audiences are exactly the same. For example, what what does the English audience like is not exactly the same as the Mexican one. So we try to put like a five star match, you know, like this one, a, a, a Vikingo versus versus Omega. But we also try to put a Mexican a Mexican uh, how do you say style of uh, this kind of like crazy madness, you know, like to have like all the different stars and all the different legends and all the different, uh, uh, well, what, what in AAA do, you know, like a little bit of, of, of insane matches. Hmm? Oh, yes, for sure. Is Vikingo, would you say he's the biggest star AAA has or Psycho Clown? Like, who would you say is the biggest star in AAA? It depends for the market. For example, in Mexico, Psycho Clown, it's still the guy who sells the tickets, you know, but but in America, uh, I can imagine that right now, Hijo del Vikingo, uh, it's it's the biggest star. And you, and, you know, for example, right now that commander, he just signed his deal with AEW. Uh, he's also a, a star that we're using here in AAA in a regular basis. So so it's 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 different markets. But but at the end of the day, all of them are big stars, and we're really happy to have them in our in our roster. Also, you know, you guys have I'm not sure if I'm going to pronounce it correctly, but Lucha Tillion, the new uh, themed entertainment center inspired by, inspired by the world of Lucha Libre, basically is a huge shopping mall in Cancun. Correct? Yes, the correct. I'm going. I'm going to say. I'm going to say the name in a correct way. It's Lucha Titlan, basically the official house of Lucha Libre. 
And yes, it's in one. It's in the most uh, popular shopping mall in 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 the Cancun area. Uh, we opened the venue the last uh, April first. It was a grand opening, and it's a totally new concept that we have created in order that for the people who visit Cancun and doesn't know so much about Lucha Libre, they can get involved with with the property. Lucha Titlan, is that going to be big for the locals or is that going to be big for people that are kind of, you know, the tourists, if you will, coming in to Cancun? Uh, well, it was created much more for tourists, but we also welcome the locals, you know, and it's a different concept. I, I, I can, uh, it's much more a theatrical way to see Lucha Libre, you know. Uh, a kind of, of medieval times, you can have dinner in, but we, we try to introduce to a different audience what, it, what, is, what is Lucha Libre. And we explain from, from scratch. If you don't know anything about Lucha Libre, you, you can enter to the show and you are going to, to understand which are the good guys, we are the, 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 the rudos, the, the hills. And basically we try to give you like a theatrical way, the manner that, that uh, that we present Lucha Libre for foreigners. That's a really kind of cool idea. Whose idea was this? Like, how, what was the genesis of it? How did it all kind of come together? It's it's super super interesting. So so okay, when when Triple A was founded, uh, we always uh, start like like a, like a caravan. You know, we we were like in touring the the whole time, but there was always like a plan to have our own venue. Much more, we were thinking in Mexico City or, or in a big metropolis like Monterrey or, or, or Guadalajara. But exactly when, when, the, when, the, when the COVID start, uh, uh, there was a few conversations with one of the biggest, how do you say in America? I think they are the rates, the, the, the owners of, of, of several uh, shopping malls and, and different kind of, of properties of real estate. So, this company, they are the owners of, of several shopping malls all around Mexico. And, and because COVID, they were, they were like trying to look a new, a new, uh, new properties to enter in, in the shopping malls uh, in terms of entertainment. And, and the idea was to have at the beginning just, just an arena, you know, a regular arena where we can like, like put shows of AAA in that arena in Cancun. But after several conversations, we realized that we were in Cancun. Just to give you, just to give you some kind of numbers, there are uh, basically almost 20 million uh, tourists arriving ar arriving every year. Uh, it's it's one of the most uh, popular destinations for, for 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 tourists all around the world, and and. There, there's a Cirque du Soleil over there, you know, Hoya, that basically Cirque du Soleil is producing a show. So, so we start to, to have these kind of conversations of how we can put a show that could be super uh, popular and could be super engaged to, to the people who watch the show and not only with the people who were with the storylines of AAA. So looking a little bit, some kind of... of papers and documentation about Cirque du Soleil at, and about another shows all around the world, we start to have this idea to put together three different companies, all of them Mexicans, uh, to try to put a new kind of show. The first one was Ventura Entertainment. Ventura Entertainment, basically they are uh, the owners of different uh, amusement parks in, in Mexico City, some aquariums. Even they are, they are the, the, they have the franchise of Top Golf for for the Mexican market. The second company is Coco Lab, Coco Lab International. Basically, they are like a multimedia company that they are in charge of create this kind of of, of uh, immersive experience. They were uh, they were the ones that created the Frida Kahlo exhibition. They were also involved right now in the in the 100th anniversary of Disney animation. So basically they are Mexicans, really, really creative guys. And the third one uh, was Lucha Libre Replay, of course. So uh, we have this kind of conversations. We spent almost a year 
trying to put the whole concept together. After that, we start to raise the capital to make it happen. And after our first conversation in October uh, 2020, no, we were we were able to open to open this project in April April 1st 2023. Basically, what we are expecting is a hundred thousand uh, tourists. It's a venue for for 580 people. Uh, uh, we are going to have shows almost daily. Even even in high season, we're expecting to have two shows a day. And you, also in the venue, you can find a restaurant where basically you can have this kind of Mexican dinner with tacos and sopes and have like this Mexican experience, Mexican gourmet experience with, with, with tasting of tequila and mezcal. And we also have like a merchandise store, uh, all these together in, in this shopping mall. Wow, that's awesome. It's like basically a destination. If you're really a tourist and you're getting into Lucha Libre, I mean, that sounds like a great destination spot to hit. Yeah, it, it, it's it's uh, it's huge. And also uh, something that is really new and really different to, to another thing that we have done before is the kind of, of special effects that you can find also in the venue, you know, uh, pyro, uh, holograms, uh, this kind of, of the special effect that you don't see in any other show, wrestling show in the world. So, so it's trying. I say to everybody, it's like trying to create the Mulan Gush destination in Cancun, and, and the name right now is Lucha Titlan. Hmm? So, Lucha Titlan. When do you kind of foresee it being like a really profitable venture? When do you kind of foresee it being that real destination spot? Well, it's it's it's. It should be really, really quickly, you know. For example, we're we're expecting to have really solid numbers for summer. So, so I can tell you. Of course, you need to, to work with the with the OTAs, with the travel agencies. You know, we're closing like all the agreements and all the deals with them. Everybody, the feedback that we have received about about the the visitors and also from the travel agencies is that it was a show that it was needed in the destination. Because even you have more than 450 attractions just in the area of Cancun. But of those 450, less than 50 of them are in the night. And less than five of them are for child. So this is a family entertainment, no? Uh, if you have two years, you can be there. If you have 90 years, you can be there. So basically, it's for the whole family. Are you going to bring like Lucha doors from the past, present, and maybe even some future stars in for autograph signings and things of that nature? Uh, well, it, it has been discussions about it, but but let me also tell you that we create like a, a the whole the whole concept, no? New IP, new luchadores. Uh, basically, what we are, the story that we are uh, telling in Lucha Titlan is that it was founded by the greatest luchador uh, called El Monarca, no? And El Monarca uh, has two childs. He passed away a couple of years ago. He has two childs, one of them legitimate, the other one from from uh, out of his, of his marriage, no? And they are going to have, these two brothers are going to have a huge fight that night for the championship and the ownership of the arena in Luchatitlan. So basically, it's a new concept. It's, the, it's new luchadores. It's a new IP, no? And at least in this in this first stage, we are not thinking in mix the universe of the triple A luchadores with the with the universe of Lucha Titlan. Hmm? So as far as AAA is concerned, with Billy Corgan and the NWA, you guys recently were a part of the World as a Vampire tour down there. What do you think about your participation with that tour? I think it was uh, it was great, you know. Uh, this it was on March. We start to have conversations with Billy Corgan and, and and his team almost in August last year, and it was the first uh, the first show that happened in in in, in the festival in, and with its with the whole concept was in Mexico City was fantastic. It was a good chemistry. Uh, everybody, uh, Billy, ourselves, we were super happy with it. 
and and I think it was a good experiment. Let's see what happened. At at least uh, for the next step, we're having discussions of how we can give follow up to this. I know that Billy has been in Australia having some kind of also matches over there with NWA and a local promotion. But I think that it could be possibilities to expand this maybe to America or maybe to another territories with, with the AAA brand. So definitely we haven't seen the end of Billy Corgan, NWA, and AAA working together. No, of course not. We are we are super happy. We're working really well together. And as a company, we try to have like open breaches with, with all the other companies. So as far as Triple Mania, I know obviously the Kenny Omega Vikino match is leg two of Triple Mania 31, which will be in July. The first part mm-hmm. of Triple Mania was the first leg was in April, April 16th. So it was a few weeks ago. But what about the mm-hmm. third leg of Triple Mania for Mexico City in August? Do you have some big plans for that? Is that something that you're you're already looking towards? Well, basically, you know that here in Mexico, the, the these kind of matches, mask versus hair or mask versus, versus mask, are, are super important for, for our audience. So we have in Tijuana, uh, we have a match where Rush and LA Park are going to be a tag team and they are going to be against uh, Psycho Clown and Sam Adonis, who are the other tag team. And basically uh, the, the, the loser bracket, no? It's going to be in Mexico City having this kind of match, uh, mass versus hair. It, it could be Sam Adonis versus Psycho Clown, or it could be L.A. Par versus Rouge. So that's another kind of thing that we are going to have over there. Uh, we want to see what happened with the Omega versus Kenny versus Hijo del Vikingo to know uh, what we can do with the Mega Championship for, for Mexico City. We also having discussions with a couple of big uh, major stars uh, American, both of them, no? to know if they can be also part of, of, of our third leg of Triple Man in Mexico City. And uh, we, are going to, we are also, you know that we were trying to work with influencers, so we also are having a couple of, of, of discussions with big influencers and, and uh, major stars here in Mexico. Very cool. You guys got a lot of stuff going on. Is the mask versus hair match, is that the biggest match you could have in Mexico? Is that like the kind of the end all be all the blow off of all matches? A hundred percent. That's the kind of match that everybody is, is waiting on. And um, yes, it's much bigger, much, much bigger than a championship match. Why is that, though? Just because the mask means so much more to the culture and, and to the character and really to, to the fans than, than, you know, mostly anything else. I can imagine. And, and, and there's there's no like a, a, a real reason of why. But, but imagine that you have a character and you have been hidden your, your identity for the last 20 years. No. So mm-hmm. so to have the opportunity to, that the people knows who is behind the mask. I think that gives like c- certain, uh, like some kind of, of uh, how do you say, like like excitement to the to the whole match. And the reason of the hair, it's well, in my opinion, it's not the same value. You know, it's like you are losing like your whole identity uh, against your hair, but it has been a little bit like that for the last fifty years. So so. The market has been super used to it's super engaged and 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 in our numbers when you present a match like that uh, tickets box office pay-per-views everything goes up hmm? when you look at just where triple is at right now it just seems like a lot of great legends are still doing it like negro costas is now a part of the team uh psychosis is there nicho el Mil- millionaire you know basically he's there vampiro is still around obviously conan is, is booking things but then you mix in vikingo and commander and Rush is kind of back and then sam adonis psycho clown is this kind of do you think your strongest roster that you've had in quite some time for triple a well yes yes totally in terms of, of quality in- of veterans of of, of uh, big names that we have in the company where i think we are in a really in a really good moment uh, but but all the times are a little bit uh, challenging you know 
For example, in 2014, when we were starting Lucha Underground, uh, we were having at the same time uh, Mystico, Rey Mysterio, Alberto El Patron, uh, Phoenix, Pentagon Jr., uh, Daga. So there has been a lot of stage in the company where we are uh, super loaded with the roster that we have, uh, but we haven't been so good in all the different stages to manage uh, the, the, uh, as many talent as we can have in the company. I think that's something that is really different right now is that basically with the creation of AW uh, and with Tony Khan coming to the market and, and giving uh, these kind of opportunities to have like double agreements, you know, between a Mexican company, a Japanese company, a US company, he's open, uh, he's open a little bit uh, the, 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 the the market, no, in terms of we can use talent in, in both ways. So, so the Mexican talent can also be uh, can also be super super happy with with the kind of agreements in terms of economical that they can have being signed by by two major major companies, one in Mexico and the other one in the U.S. So, if you tell me the reason, it's we are really open. We like to we like to work with a lot of companies. I was having dinner last week with with the people from from impact and uh, we are having these really good conversations with the people from from aw we also working with nwa so basically if you open uh, the breaches and you can uh, if and if you can uh, support the wrestlers to be in several promotions at the same time i think it's a way to have all the talent happy and it's what is happening right now in triple a and even if you look at it, Conan just was doing Rey Mysterio's Hall of Fame speech, you know, about a month ago for WrestleMania. So, and obviously Dragon Lee had a nice little open door to NXT. So it does seem like, you know, even WWE is not like a, you know, far beyond reach. You guys can work with anybody. Yeah, well, in terms of exchange of talent, I think uh, WWE is not open to that, you know. They, they are going to sign the talent and they are going to use... Uh, any 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 people that they're signing in, in an exclusive way, I don't see WWE lending anyone from their roster to a third company, or at least in the short term. But as you said, all the other companies are uh, are putting his his eyes in Mexican talent, and and that's really good for everybody because uh, the Mexican talent is improving a lot. Uh, there are so, so, so much talent right now in the market, you know, as you said, Dijo El Vikingo, Commander, but we also have armies, uh, Baby Extreme, people that they are in, in his late, uh, in his uh, 20s or in, in 18, 90 years old, and they are being super spectacular. So I think the next five years are going to be super, super important for, for in terms of, of talent for the, for the Mexican market. Lavi, I know you wanted to touch on some uh, AEW stuff for sure. Yes, uh, thank you, John. So um, that leads in really well for the first couple of questions. So, um, Dorian, I'm sure you've you've been very busy administering AAA, so I don't know if, if you came across this debate on Twitter or heard about it, but uh, right before Vikino's uh, debut on AEW, there was a, sort of a going back and forth debate. Should he just, you know, appear? cold and then blow everyone out of the water when they meet him or should there be like a series of vignettes and highlights building up to his debut obviously it was a smashing success but um you know what would you have done and and what did you think about the debut on on aw um, a little bit ago well ma the market is changing really fast you know and you uh, what is what is really important is uh, that the, the fans are not to be, uh, you, you cannot have everybody happy, you know? Someone are going to complain because nobody knows him. Another one are, is going to complain because he's, because he's not so talented as they, uh, as they think he could be. So at the end of the day, the important thing is, is a result. And, it, and as you said, he was smashing. So, so I don't care how, how he was presented. At the end of the day, the result was really, really positive for everybody. Hmm? For sure. So, 
you know, I think with with COVID and travel, certainly that you know limited things for for a number of years. But it appears that you know um, the relationship with AEW is is the best that it's ever been. Would you define it as such as well? Well, uh, it, it it has been as any kind of relationship with good moments and bad moments, and, and as everybody knows, in December when when Dragon when Dragon Lee was presented in in WWE and all that stuff there was a kind of uh, uh, aw was was not so co un, uh, comfortable and and it even conan has has been talking how was the conversation with tony khan about it but right now i think uh, we have solved all all the issues we are super super respectful so we understand really well how was the position of aw in, in with all these things happening in the in the mexican market and with the mexican talent but for us they are our partners we are going to protect their interest we are super happy working with them i think they are giving a great window to the roster to the mexican roster as rush and commander uh, hijo del vikingo so so i think yes we are right now we are in a in a really good moment and moment to win with jw hmm? So as you were talking about Rajan a, a moment ago, um, that it's really great for the talent because not only do they have um, be able to uh, work with, with AAA as, as a home promotion, go to AEW through AEW or, or potentially just, you know, being connected to New Japan or, and travel to Japan. But is there is there like a tipping point where you know, AAA's talent is, is traveling so much that it might... Uh, affect the home promotion. You know, when we look back on mm -hmm. WCW in the 90s, you know, so many talents came from Mexico that, you know, it, it might have been challenging to sort of restock um, and rebuild from there. So is there a point where you might say, okay, it's great that you're traveling X percentage of the time, but we, we need you here for this percentage? Um. I understand really, really well your 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 question, and I think at this moment in AAA, uh, we have been in different stages. You know, for example, as you as you said, we, when we were working with WCW, when we were working with Lucha Underground, right now that we're working with different uh, promotions, there are so many Mexican talent right now. You know, and some of them fit really well to the American market. Another one is uh, doesn't fit so well in the American market, but feels super, super well in Mexico. You know, an example could be, for example, Pagano, no? Pagano in Mexico, he can have matches every single day, you know? The, the, the audience and the crowd loves him. Maybe, maybe his style is not uh, what the American audience is looking for, or at least uh, the kind of, of, of indie uh, audience, but we have Mr. Iwana, we have the clowns, we have so much talent that we can have this, well, we can give to the talent this opportunity to be traveling. For example, I was talking with, with Bikingo that it was his birthday last week, and he was in Australia, and after that he was in America, and after that he was traveling to Mexico to a show. So, so I think I'm not concerned about having the talent traveling in a, in a, traveling so much because First of all, we have a lot of talent here in Mexico that we can use to, to, to have our house shows and our TV shows. And the second one is because there's a new uh, generation of, of young talent that is also uh, growing up so fast in our roster that at, at, at least for the moment, I think we are, we are in a good stage. And also, for example, we just sent uh, 20 talents to Lucha Titlán. So, so we are trying to develop talent really, really, really fast. Hmm? So in terms of talent flowing the other way, perhaps a talent coming from the U.S. or or Europe or something like that. So Sam Adonis had recently shared that um, working with AAA, he's under a, a right of first refusal. So, um, you know, he uh, whenever you need him for bookings, that that's where he'll be. And then I think, secondly, he's with MLW. Is that how it might work with some of the uh, the premier U.S. talent that they're not necessarily under exclusive contracts, but um, a first uh, right of first refusal? Yeah, exactly. Well, the first thing that we need uh, in order to have the, the talent happy with us is that basically 
that the financials make, make sense for everybody, no? And we are Mexican promotion. We live uh, under another currency, no? Peso is not the same as dollar. Economicals in Mexico and in the United States are totally different. So, so we need to give to the American talent this kind of non-exclusivity that they can create his own number also in America, you know? For example, right now we have Sam Adonis. We are also uh, uh, right now in our roster working a lot with Gringo Loco, with Jack Carwell, uh, sometimes with Willie Mack, another time with people from AW. So, so in terms to this, uh, be a, a profitable business for everybody. We have non-exclusives with American talent, but as you said, with, with the first option. So, so uh, that's the way that it's working right now for us. And we feel that everybody feels comfortable with that. So in the U.S. right now, and this has been going on through different cycles for a number of years, there's different streaming services. Certainly Fight has, you know, outside of um, Peacock or WWE and so on, Fight has really established themselves as as um, sort of the premier streaming service, as you know. And I know that mm -hmm. AAA works with them and Pro Wrestling TV. But when I think about it, in terms of the potential chess pieces and, and the potential deals that you already have in place, there's very few promotions where um, somebody can work with like a AAA and really like establish themselves as a tentpole. Um, we've seen even Premier Streaming. Um, uh, I'm not sure if you're familiar with Freddie Prince Jr., but um, mm -hmm. he just got involved in this this new startup as well. So you'd imagine things are going on there. So has there been like additional conversations with streaming partners, both startups and existing ones, or in terms of the U.S. market, are you set with Fight and Pro Wrestling TV? Uh, well, there's a lot There's a lot of points in that conversation, you know, because at the end of the day, uh, it could be a transactional BOV, you know, as Fight, you no, know? Fight being, in my opinion, the most the most important and the most relevant, uh, the numbers that we have that we have done with fight are really impressive. No, uh, are really impressive at least for in a standpoint of view uh, from Mexico, and we are super happy working with them. But as you know, also in terms to have the the most important thing for us is to have more eyeballs. No, and it's not easy. It's not an easy. Uh, it's not an easy challenge that we have in America. Uh, we were ha we were having discussions for almost a year and a half with the people from Univision. Uh, at the end, we we it was uh, we we weren't in a position to close a deal with them. So right now we are looking for you know for new opportunities. We are having conversations with with a couple of of of, of OTTs no in in the U.S. Uh, we're also having conversations about, uh, it's a little bit the, the dilemma of the, of the chicken and the egg. Well, what is going first? To create more eyeballs via digital, no? In order to close a better deal with, with a regular uh, network, no? So, so we are in that, in that dilemma. We are having conversations to, to create something like a docu-series or something like that, that can give much more engage to the American audience. We are also having conversation with a couple of OTTs uh, looking to, to put our, our content in the US. We are also having conversations about fast channel, no? To be in America. So in terms of options, there's a lot of things that you can do or, or, or even just to create a fan base, giving your product for free in platforms as Twitch or YouTube, no? So, so I think we're going to take a decision in the, in the second semester of this year at least at the beginning of the year, we, we have been really busy with, with the Mexican market and with the launch of this new venture as, as Luchatitlan, that if everything goes well, we, we are going to try to scale up and to create a second and a third uh, venue really quickly. So there's a lot of things happening here in Mexico. We need to focus also really well in the American market, no? but, but I think that is going to happen until 2024. Hmm? So uh, one of the things that I caught last year that I um, watched a special or two was on uh, domestic US TV where a number of specials on Estrella TV. Um, is there a uh, discussion of, of having additional specials or that, that has ended for the time being? Uh, well, we're having also discussions with Australia. With Australia, it's just, 
in a in an uh, the standalone no of triple manias no nothing more than that even i, I can tell you uh, 2020 2023 has been a really challenging year in terms of of content no everybody's like cutting expenses no in 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 the content area no so we well but the sports at the same time is giving a, a much more value to the to the to the tv rights so so we are in that stage that we are not so big uh, to to have a, a multi-million dollar deal no and we are not so small to be so desperate to close a deal of a hundred of of, of of pennies no so so we are going to take the best option for the company and we hope to have something for real at least in the second semester or the or, or next year hmm? So one of the relationships that everyone has been watching uh, carefully is, of course, um, the relationship with Disney and, and the Marvel brand. I don't believe it it has yet migrated to the U.S. and it might not be planned for that. But the the special and apologies for the pronunciation, El Origin de la Mascara, um, was released, mm -hmm. I believe, in a number of of markets. Um, how is how are things going with Marvel and Disney? Uh, we're super happy to be working with them. I think we we feel super uh, proud of, of 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 having this kind of collaboration with them. And and the product was created for Latin America. I don't know, and it's a, a Disney decision if it's going to be launched in America sometime. No, uh, I don't know about it. We are working right now in a project to you know that the la well I don't know if you know, but the last year we were working with different malls uh, with different malls all around all around Mexico you know to present the product of lucha libre to a different audience so the idea right now is that this product no the marvel lucha libre edition to start to tour in, in Mexico for the second semester no with the with the marvel characters in the different in the different malls in Mexico um just out of my curiosity as um I discovered the show with my kids on, on Disney Plus, um, Ultraviolet and Black Scorpion, which I believe lasted yeah. just one season. Um, was there um, was there involvement of, of AAA in that? And and as you were working with Disney and, and they weren't sure how long that show would last, was there talk about like co-promotion of that and maybe the, the special that you had taped? No, no. The reality is that, that Disney is so big that they have different divisions. That division is the one in the U.S. And, and if I'm not wrong, the first character that was involved in the in the in that in that TV show was Lou Demon. Uh, and ultra, even the name, when it was announced, was Lou Demon and Ultraviolet, something like that. No, I don't know the real reasons of why uh, they are not using the Blue Demon IP anymore. But no, we we were not in conversations or engaged in any in any level with, with that property. Thank you. Um, so in terms of thinking about live shows in the US, um, mm -hmm. it's been really interesting to watch um, the different approaches, of course, um, uh, most recently or, or most, um, you know, um, you know, uh, spotlighted has had been the show, um, you know, in, in Arizona recently. Mm -hmm. um, in the past, you had participated in WrestleCon, but but not this year. So I think there's you know there's a variety of different audiences, as as you know and have talked about um, just a little while ago. In terms of you know maybe there's a hardcore audience that's waiting to see AAA like um, at the the theater at Madison Square Garden, where um, you know they'll sell out because they've been anticipating that. Then there's um, audiences that go to WrestleMania, then there's maybe more of a mainstream audience that you're looking to draw in Arizona. Do you think that the approach can incorporate a number of these things and it's like strategic when and where and how in the U.S.? Well, um, U.S. has been, a, a, how do you say, a difficult market for, for AAA, you know? We, we have, there's a lot of potential over there, but we haven't been really good knowing uh, how to to take that potential of the brand in terms of like touring. Uh, we produce a show in December in Phoenix in terms in terms of, of attendance, in terms of, of the quality of the show was really, really good. Everybody was happy. 
but in terms of economicals, wasn't as expected for us. So basically what we are looking for, and, and that's the kind of conversation that we're having right now, uh, we need a partner and we need a partner in America who knows how to run live events for the, for the Mexican market. No? So there are, there are not so many companies that do this in America. There are just a couple of them that are super successful. So we are having conversation with them to know if there's a possibility to run uh, some kind of beta shows in, in certain markets to know the potential about it. It's also, again, the chicken and the egg dilemma, what it goes first, the TV show, uh, to get a network that can give eyeballs to the property, no? or, or to, to launch our live event and a touring of 10 or, or I don't know how many cities. So, so we are working on that. Hmm? We are working on that. It's all, it's always in our radar, but, but uh, we have been there. It has, it, it ha it hasn't been as successful as we would, but we will try. We will be, uh, how do you say, trying and trying until we have success over there. Hmm? So, just to clear up some. Um... Uh, uh, probably rumors is too strong a word, but, you know, discussion for a while that it seemed like very quickly Conrad Thompson was talking about AAA and it, it seemed to come out of nowhere. And then there was talk that on WrestleMania weekend, he was going to help promote a show um, in California um, that was several thousand seats. Did, Con you know, were there discussions with Conrad about becoming like a, a U.S. promoter? Yes, for sure. It was it was when we when we create this uh, event with it, and and I was there the, the the last match of Ric Flair, and with the response that the Mexican talent has over there, Phoenix, Bandido, Taurus, uh, everybody was super happy and was super excited and super pop up about the opportunity that we could have in the American market, and the idea was to to start in WrestleMania weekend. The problem uh, wasn't Conrad, was us, because we were so full with, with the different projects, no? Uh, we opened the venue of, of Cancun the same weekend that, that WrestleMania weekend was. So, so after the numbers weren't uh, as happy for us in, in Phoenix, we decided to, to, to stop and to focus again in, in what is, imagine, 2022 was the beginning after pandemic, no? So 2023 for us should be really good in the numbers and in the profitability of, of the whole company. So we are refocusing our, our the strategy and the core of the company to be so, super profitable again as we were before pandemic. And, and the U.S. Wasn't, uh, wasn't good for us in terms of economicals at the end of the year. So we were taking a reshape and, and, and a refocusing of the of the whole uh, of the whole company and and we are right now just uh, really how do you say I don't want to say focus so many times but but it's like yes we, we are like like taking our position again and 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 that's the reason of why we didn't do that show because even last year we were traveling a lot and we were having discussions with, with the promoters from Pico Rivera, we were ha having also discussions with the, if not the Home Depot anymore, I think it's the, the Health Dignity Center, no? And and yes, we were, we was trying to put a show over there. Um, what else, even even having discussions with the people from Impact, with Conrad, what we can do. We were, we, imagine, we were, we were trying to put a match between uh, Hijo el Vikingo versus We Lost Free. That was that we were trying to put together, no? But how do you say it was impossible? And, and we will try to do it in another stage, no? So I've been um, thinking about it pro probably even more than I should, um, sort of like Lucha Libre in, in America. And what you described in terms of um, uh, what you're doing in Cancun in terms of a... Um, a stationary show has been often mm -hmm. what I've imagined potentially viable in the U.S. in terms of a, uh, like you mentioned, Cirque du Soleil, a Cirque du Soleil experience where um, it could be um, lucha stars that are already known or, or you know, sort of created 
um, with, with a story that fed, threads through it where somebody could come as, as a family um, and really come and experience this, this high level um, tour that comes to your town um, twice a year, um, sort of like Disney on ice type of experience working with like, um, you know, a, a felled entertainment that runs Ringling Brothers yeah, yeah, yeah. or, you know, something like that has, have promoters ever reached out, in, you know, in that regard? Yeah, and, and that's one of the things that we're going to try with Lucha Titlan, you know. Uh, it's, it, okay, there are, there are like many, many ideas that come to my mind really quickly. The first one is, for example, uh, when you go to Lucha Babu, no? Lucha Babu is a fantastic way to present the Lucha Libre to the American audience, no? In my opinion, they, they have barriers, no? They are a burlesque show, no? They are just for adults, no? Uh, the people who get much more engaged with the lucha matches are the childs, no? So you need to do a family-oriented show, no? But uh, Lucha Babum has created something totally new, you know, and, and, and su successful and has been in the market for I don't know how many years, but for a lot. And, and has been running for several years, three, three or four shows in a year. It's a great concept. So uh, what we're going... <laughs> I don't know if I need to say that, but we are going to try to scale up really, really fast in Mexico, no? Uh, for example, we are thinking Cozumel, no? Cozumel is one, is the island here in Mexico that received more cruises, no? I think they are going to receive over a thousand cruises this year and uh, more or less about uh, three million people, no? Just in the island. So we are going to try to put a second venue over there. We're also going to try to put another one in Cabo. But, but what happened? If the next one we try to open it in Phoenix or maybe in Chicago, no, to try to taste the market and to know if we can have like a kind of, of medieval times, you know, uh, medieval times concept. We have been in discussion with the people from Felt uh, when we were talking about Marvel Lucha Libre Edition, but we need we 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 need to scale up much more the audience and the kind of show that we need to present in order to have a big a big business. So yeah, you are totally correct. Also in that manner, La B, I think we are separating, uh, how do you say, separating a lot from the WWE concept, you know? And, and it's, it's a concept that is going to be complicated for WWE to try to take over in order that they don't have the legacy or, 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 or the roots, no? About, about the Mexican Lucha Libre. So for, for, for myself, Lucha Titlan, it's a, it's a new blue, blue ocean. We can, it's like having the, the Ringling Brothers and the Cirque du Soleil at the same time, no? We are trying to create our own Cirque du Soleil and we are trying to expand that vertical of the business in a really fast way. Hmm? No, thank you. And this has been so insightful in terms of uh, AAA's growth in business. So in terms of my question, before I turn it over to John, one of the things, of course, as I'm sure you're observing as an expert and executive in the business too, is sort of New Japan's efforts in the U.S. over a number of years. And I would say over the last six months, they've sort of reframed their live events experience rather than some big shows, some small shows, somewhere it gets confusing, where they said, basically, we're going to do X number of shows um, a year. And first, it will be on pay-per-view, then it'll be on fight, then it'll be on, you know, access TV, and so on. So sort of like trimming it down, because previously, you know, they might have some shows that did 2,700, but then there'd be a show in Florida that did 600, and people weren't sure who was going to be where. Um and I think they have, you know, an opportunity, of course, with Mercedes Monet, who I'm, I wouldn't be, you know, surprised, of course, if, if you have your eye on in terms of potential talent, if that were viable. But in terms of like thinking about it, like, like a business case study, uh, being an expert in the industry, what do you make of New Japan's efforts in the U.S. over the last few years? Um, <laughs> what a good question. I, I, I went to Coachella uh, like a couple of weeks ago, and I was super surprised that the first night the headliner was uh, a Mexican, well, not a Spanish guy, no? Uh, uh, Pat Bonnie, you know, with, with a regional Mexican band music, and the second night was a, a Korean band, no? A girl Korean band. Uh, I understand what, what New Japan is trying to do. 
But the problem that we have is that at the end, uh, even them, no, us for the Mexican market, and them for 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 the hardcore wrestling audience, it's a niche product, you know, and it's going to be a niche product. It's for me the the product that New Japan present. It's it's going to be super difficult to be mainstream, no, and more. I don't know. Do you have the numbers? Do you know how many? How big is the Japanese community in the U.S.? I don't. I can imagine that maybe a million people from Japan living. I don't know. It's not the Koreans. It's not the. It's not the Chinese community. No, and and I think in terms of engagement, no, it's going to be complicated for the, for for them. But but I don't know the financials. No, I don't know the business plan. So so it's just an intuition that I have. For I think it's going to be difficult to be profitable in the, in American business. No? It's going to be difficult to to get engagement. No, of course, being part of these kind of events as Forbidden Door, where where AW has a, a, a much more big audience, I think it's the best the best manner for New Japan to be uh, to be in the loop. You know, but in the other hand, what what could happen? If Tony Khan bought uh, New Japan, no, that could be also a good opportunity of how to expand the AW the AW business to, to Japan, and and to have the takeover and a little bit of control of that side of of, of the world. I don't know. It's it, it's interesting, you know. I think Tony Khan has a really good vision about it. He knows how how why and how he's doing the business. And for me, the New Japan in the U.S. it's a little bit. Uh, it's really it's similar as when we try to to launch Lucha on the run, you know. We we were having a great product, we were having super good matches, but the eyeballs weren't so big, so so it was impossible to make the company big, you know. And it's no, not you... it's not a matter of quality, it's a matter of engagement. You have a great point in terms of like Tony Tony Khan basically becoming like sort of like the mm, the representative potentially for New Japan in the U.S. or or North America. I had often thought about it when Mark Cuban was um, very involved with Access TV in, in New Japan, and he'd go to the shows. That sort of like maybe he would have that role. Um, we've seen with with Impact. I guess I have one more question. Um, we've seen with Impact Wrestling that they've made a lot of big executive hires, and they've talked about looking at sort of like potential. Um, acquisitions in wrestling and, and John and I talk about every week what what could they buy you know they, they have a company so I guess it, it speaks to a broader question like Dorian are you open for business in terms of meaning that if somebody were to make an offer for AAA outright is that something you would discuss or rights in terms of a certain region or because it's because of the family legacy that's off the table it's more about doing deals and, and growing the business <laughs> I think I think we will be always open to, to discussions, you know, hmm? always. It, it's not a matter if we're a family business or not. We are. We, this is a business, no? And I think that's important thing, no? And I know that the impact has been in, in a lot of conversations. Uh, as you can imagine, we are really prominent in the Mexican market, our numbers and our financials in, in, in Latin America and much more in Mexico are super strong. We had just invest a lot of amount of money uh, making this new vertical in the business. But as you also as you also said, we haven't we think that the next step for AAA to grown up in terms of valuation, to grown up in terms of financials, basically it's how we can take over the American market, at least the, at least the Mexican, the Mexican uh, market in the US. It's uh, it's a difficult process. We have been trying for so long, and uh, we're open. If it's an investment, if it's a partnership, if it's a joint venture, uh, it's if a carve out of rights like we made with Lucha on the round. No, it's it's interesting all the possibility. Well, when everybody was saying that WWE, the rumor, no, you know, when everybody was trying to 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 know who was going to be the 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 buyer of WWE. I think everybody was surprised that it was a merger, you know? So so it's really interesting how, how the business is working right now. Hmm? No, thank you. John? 
So with Vikingo, just going back to him for a second, and and how great he was received here. If you look at the ratings too, that kind of negative stuff that was going online to think, oh, they shouldn't have said it's a dream match. And then when people watched it, it did turn out to be a dream match because it really was a dream match. It actually enhanced the ratings for that week. For you know, when you go into the last quarter hour, that almost never happens. The AEW always goes down. So Vikingo helped, Kenny Omega helped. That kind of leads into a rematch for Triple Mania. But is he? And it's great, maybe crazy to say, or maybe not, but is he the Rey Mysterio of today as far as Triple H is concerned? Would you consider him the Rey Mysterio? Uh, I don't know if you can say that Messi is the new Maradona, no? It's always complicated to 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 say uh, how how big is a new talent going to be, no? That basically he's he's an outlier, he's an outlier. That that's for sure, you know. I don't know if he's going to be the new Rey Mysterio, if he's going to be bigger than Rey Mysterio. I don't know yet, but he's an outlier, no? Commander is another outlier. And and it's amazing how young both of them are. And they are just starting to, to, to have a career in the US. So let's see what happened with, with both of them. Also, you have Dragon Lee uh, really close to, well, having his debut in NXT, but I think he's also a great ta- talent that could be in the could be one of the of the uh, main main Mexican talent that could arrive to America. So so let's see let let's see the, the response of, to that answer in, in the next five years. Hmm? Just throwing this out there, Shinsuke Nakamura, when he was in WB a few months ago, he did wrestle a match for Pro Wrestling Noah. So. Just throwing it out there, so maybe Mysterio, Ray Mysterio, can be talked into it, or maybe WWE, or somebody can be talked into it. I know that was a great mood of retirement. It's a different situation, but hey, you never know. They mm. they would never have done that years ago, so maybe they're kind of more open to letting guys wrestle in different Could promotions. Be. You never know, right? I think you never know, and and also there's a. It depends who is the booker, no, and who who is in charge of creative and how open they are. In in terms of of these kind of forbidden doors, no, uh, I don't know who is in, in in control of creating, no. The the book said that that the Triple H, no, but mm-hmm. but it depends about about many situations, and I think that right now with the merger, uh, they are so busy, no, trying to 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 close this deal, and I think they are going to to at least for the next six months they are going to be so busy in in how to uh, consolidate no both companies in just one entity that it's going to be difficult to see that kind of movement at least in the short term hmm? more, more you are going to see much more between ufc and wwe of course no that what wwe is going to lend his talent to another company in a worldwide basis hmm? very true so for triple a tell us you know about what's coming up next and where everybody can see and find triple a well basically we are going to have our next triple mania in july 15 one uh, five after that we go straight to to another major show verano escandalo that is going to happen in aguascalientes one week just after after triple mania in tijuana and in august 12th we're going to have triple mania 31st in, in mexico city so basically three big shows in, in less than one month or our, or our focus uh, are over there in creative. Uh, we are having all, you can see triple, triple A in the United States in YouTube. Basically, we, we upload all our shows over there. Uh, you can see Triple Mania on Fight, no? Um, what else? And, and as I told you guys, basically, all, we also open this new venue in Cancun. So anytime that anyone, you guys your audience can go to cancun to see this new show and they can give us your feedback that would be great also for us and of course fight always check out triple a uh, on fight and triple mania coming up on fight with dorian thank you so much for all the time really appreciate it no thank you thank you so much guys I, uh, i'm sorry again because sometimes my I, i'm that kind of guy that my my brain uh things in, in Spanish and I try to translate to English so, so I'm not so so fluently, no? But I I hope that I was 
clear with all with all the Very questions clear. and all the doubts. Yep. Hmm? Perfect. Yes. Everything perfect. Is Thank great. You. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dorian. Appreciate all the time. Thank you, guys. Hmm? Have a great night. Bye bye. All right, live. Let's hit the plugs. You can follow us on or follow me, excuse me, on Twitter and Instagram at Two Man Power Trip. Check out the website tmptempire.com. Lavi, what do you got? Yeah, follow me on Twitter at Lavi Marg, L A V I E M A R G. Check out my long form articles on lioncubjobsearch.com and check out our LinkedIn group, um, which has uh, executives uh, from all over the wrestling world, even though we're a brand new uh, a group, the business of the business, pro wrestling industry. Nice. Thank you, everybody, for tuning in. See you right back here next week for a little business of the business. We'll see you next week, folks.